I'm sure you've noticed that after a cold, long, uh, hard, snowy winter, it's been an amazing spring, hasn't it? Like, man, the flowers and the bushes and the trees in my yard are just exploding with new life and new growth. And, and springtime is one of those times of the year where we really see the difference between vitality and deadness, right? Like the things that are alive are really alive right now. And so what a great season for us to think about that same thing in our souls. What does it mean for our souls to be alive to God? What does it mean to have vital and vibrant Christian faith? I think this is something we all want. Like the fun about preaching a sermon series like this is that there's not a single one of you in here that's a Christian that wants dead, lifeless, stale Christianity, right? Like if you're in this thing, you're in it because you want to experience vitality in life. And likewise, if you're a non-Christian and you're here, my guess is that what you've rejected is the dead, lifeless, cold Christianity that maybe you've seen in various people. But, but if there were such a thing as real spiritual life, you might be inclined to say, okay, I'll give that a shot. I want to know more about that. So wherever you find yourself this morning, we're talking about something we all want. And, and part of what we're trying to do is to ask this question, what keeps us from experiencing vital Christianity? What are the, what are the hindrances that, that keep this from being a reality? To personalize it, we might ask the question this way, what keeps you from experiencing vital Christianity? I want to suggest this morning something so simple, and so obvious, that perhaps you've never thought about it. But according to the prophet Amos, it's one of the main reasons for a lack of spiritual vitality. And that is the tendency to separate worship from obedience. Something in us wants to place these two things in different categories. And God's people in the Old Testament uh, had done the same thing. Listen to Amos chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. And by the way, we're going to be in the book of Amos, so while I read this, you can go to the table of contents and find out where that is, okay? It's hard to find. Uh, Amos 5, 21 through 24. Listen to what God says. I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. So what are God's people doing? Well, obviously they're doing the outward activities of worship, right? This text mentions the singing of songs, the bringing of offerings, the gathering together in solemn assembly. They're still doing these external activities. What are they not doing? They're not practicing justice and righteousness. In other words, they had separated worship from obedience. Um, they're still doing the external actions or activities of worship, but without a heart of genuine obedience to God. So what I want to say to you this morning is really quite simple, grounded right here in the book of Amos, and that is simply this. You will never experience vital Christianity without resolute obedience. You'll never experience vital Christianity without resolute obedience. And so that's kind of the title of the sermon this morning, resolute obedience. My aim there is to capture that there's something about this that requires resolve, decision, willfulness. There's a, a willful obedience to God that is at the heart of vital Christianity. The, the most vital Christians, the ones who are most alive and most joyful and most vibrant spiritually, are those who have made up their minds and set their wills toward obeying God. Who see worship as obedience and obedience as worship. And so before we dive into the solution, before we examine what Amos has to tell us about how we solve this problem, let's explore the problem a little bit more. Uh, how do we tend to separate worship and obedience? What are some of the ways we do this? I want to suggest there are sort of two 
um, equal but opposite problems, two sides of the horse we can fall off of if you want to think about it that way. The first would be this. The first would be a worshipless obedience. Okay? A worshipless obedience. In other words, an obedience that rather than being rooted in gratitude and worship to God is rooted in a sense of duty and sort of a sense of earning God's approval. The Bible has a specific term for this. It calls this works righteousness. It's the idea that if I obey God, if I do what God wants, that's the way of earning God's acceptance and approval. So what anchors and motivates my obedience is I want to obey my way into God's good graces. So it's not worship of God and gratitude to God that fuels my obedience. It's an attempt to earn God's favor or to demonstrate to God that I'm a good person. And this is one of the beautiful things that the gospel of Jesus starts to dismantle. This this inclination is in us deep. There's something about the human heart that wants to believe, hey, if we just do the right thing, that's what makes us acceptable to God or even in the sight of others. And so... The gospel of Jesus Christ begins to sort of cut away at the foundations of this way of thinking. Uh, For instance, in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, this great summary of the gospel message that says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. Not a result of works. You're not saved. You don't enter into God's good, God's good graces by your obedience and by your effort and by your moral striving. That's not how this thing works. And so the first thing we need to reject is a worshipless obedience. And maybe some of you guys have grown up in traditions where that was what you were taught about God, is if you just obey God, if you just do the right thing, um, then, then you'll be accepted. Then you'll make it to heaven or be accepted by God or whatever the end goal might be. I want you to see this morning, that's not how the grace of God operates. There's a second side of the horse that we can fall off on. And and so if the one side is a worshipless obedience, the other side might be an obedience-free worship. Um, and, And there are two expressions of this that I've encountered. There are probably more, but two particularly that I want to talk about. An obedience free worship. Uh, The first form of this is a point of view that has come to be known, (laughs) surprisingly, as free grace, which is a funny term because it's neither free nor gracious. Uh, People who hold this point of view say, if you say anything at all about obedience, you're destroying grace. God's grace is so radical, so free in the way they use it, that I can be saved by grace without ever intending to obey God at all. Or to say it another way, I can have Jesus as Savior without having him as Lord. And this point of view diminishes the work of Jesus Christ. Because what it says is Jesus is Savior, and yet not Lord. Uh, Jesus has died to save me, but doesn't really change me. God's grace is powerful enough to save me freely, but not to transform me deeply. And so this separating of worship and obedience should be rejected by all of us who love and know the Bible. There's a second form of this kind of mindset, and it sounds like this. Hey, look, look, we can't obey God perfectly, and that's why God sent Jesus, to obey in our place, to die for our sins, so that our disobedience could be forgiven. To that I would say, amen. That is absolutely good news. And is that where the good news stops? No, it's not. The gospel is not, Jesus died for me, therefore I'm freed from obedience. The good news of the gospel is, Jesus died for me, therefore I'm freed for obedience. The gospel is not just that Jesus died for sinners to forgive us, but also that he rose from the dead He ascended to the right hand of the Father. He now reigns as king over the entire universe. He's called us into his kingdom as his joyful and obedient subjects. And he sent his Holy Spirit so that we can die to sin and live to righteousness. So that we can have power to actually live differently. The good news is not just Jesus dies for our lack of obedience, but also Jesus lives to empower a new kind of obedience. Obedience. 
And this is why Jesus says to his disciples in the Great Commission, hey, look, go into all the world and teach people to obey everything I've commanded you. He says, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bring them into this relationship with God that's made possible through the Son, by the Spirit, and teach them to do what I say. This is discipleship. This is the gospel. This is the good news. So now that we've cleared the weeds of some of the faulty ways of thinking about obedience to God, let's come back to the book of Amos. We've said that, that our fundamental problem is to separate worship from obedience. That this is not a new problem. This is what God's people were doing in the days of Amos. How did God's people get here? How did they get to the place where they had somehow unhinged worship and obedience? Where they could show up at church and sing songs and give offerings and ignore what God had said to do in the relationships they had with one another and still feel like everything was fine? How did they get to the place where they'd separated worship and obedience? Well, here's the, here's the thing that Amos shows us. You can't actually separate worship and obedience. If you're not obeying God, then you're not actually worshiping God. Uh, look again at what God says in Amos 5.21. I mean, this is strong language. Listen to what God says. I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. In other words, hey, I know you're getting together and doing the activities of worship. Like you're having a church gathering. It's just that I, I don't see that as worship. That might qualify to you as something religious, but I don't delight in that. What God's saying is you're not actually worshiping me. Like you're doing something, but what you're doing is not actually worship. Why? Because you can't separate worship and obedience. Obedience is worship. Worship is obedience. If you're not obeying God, then you're not worshiping God. Anytime we have an obedience problem, we also have a worship problem. There's no way we can be worshiping God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength and not loving our neighbor as ourselves. We're obeying God in the world. So, so Amos is trying to hold this up and show us, hey, anytime we think that we can separate worship from obedience, we're, we're fooling ourselves. That's not how the kingdom of God works. And Amos is showing us that this kind of hypocrisy can be very subtle. Um, we can think we're worshiping God. We can be coming together and doing the things even as we pursue disobedience, even as we have no intention of actually obeying God. And, and look, God's people didn't just arrive at this place in a moment. It happened over years. It happens by a slow erosion, not a quick process. It's not like they just woke up one day and decided they were going to keep showing up to worship but not practice justice and righteousness in the world. This, this happened through all kinds of little subtle compromises over years and years and years, and now they end up at the place where God says, hey, you're getting together for this solemn assembly, but it's, it's not a delight to me. You, you say you're worshiping, but that's not what worship is because there's a disconnect between what you're saying about me and what you're doing in your life. Let me give you a little illustration of how this can happen. Let me try to pull this from the book of Amos into the modern day, all right? On January 31st of this year, the state of Massachusetts filed a lawsuit against Purdue Pharma, the manufacturers of the opioid OxyContin. If you've been paying attention to the news, you've probably heard about this going on in the world around us. Over the past decade, 11,000 people have died from opioid overdoses in the state of Massachusetts alone. And another 100,000, catch that number, another 100,000 have experienced overdoses that are not fatal. And the state of Massachusetts alleges that Purdue Pharma bears some of the blame for that epidemic. Now, you may have differing opinions on the merit of the case, that's not what I'm here to argue about. What I want to do is I want you to listen as I read from the legal brief filed with the Superior Court of Massachusetts that describes the behavior that led to this lawsuit. Listen, here's what the legal brief says. 
When Purdue Pharma identified a particular doctor as a profitable target, Purdue reps visited the doctor frequently, often weekly, sometimes almost every day. Purdue salespeople asked doctors to list specific patients they were scheduled to see and pressed the doctors to commit to put the patients on Purdue opioids. By the time a patient walked into a clinic, the doctor, in Purdue's words, had already guaranteed that he would prescribe Purdue's drugs. Purdue rewarded high prescribing doctors with gifts and cash. So imagine you're going to see your doctor, and before you even show up at the office, he's already agreed with the sales rep what he's going to prescribe you. Most of us would be concerned about that, right? It goes on to say, Purdue judged its sales reps by how many opioids they got doctors to prescribe. Sales reps who generated the most prescriptions won bonuses and prizes. Reps who failed to get patients on opioids were placed on probation, put on performance improvement plans, and fired. Now, I'm not a judge. I don't live in the state of Massachusetts. It's not my job to render a verdict on the guilt or innocence of Purdue Pharma. I merely want to point out one thing. Some of these doctors were Christians. And some of these pharmaceutical sales reps were Christians. And they didn't wake up one day and say, today I'm going to further the opioid epidemic in America. Nobody had that intention. Those sales reps had managers breathing down their necks and encouraging them to meet their sales quotas. They were trying to keep their jobs. Those doctors had patients who had chronic pain. They were trying to help people with really difficult symptoms. In the course of their daily work, they made little ethical compromises. And those little ethical compromises reverberating throughout an entire medical ecosystem perpetuated a massive social problem. That's the kind of thing Amos is talking about. No one sets out to exploit the poor and further injustice in the world. It's just what happens when we don't resolutely obey God. In using this illustration, I'm aware that I'm speaking to a room full of medical professionals and pharmaceutical reps. So I use this illustration intentionally because I just want to get down in your world, right? I could have talked about something that was unrelated to our congregation, but, you know, I want to be a little more fun than that. (laughs) Obeying God has to do with how you do your job, how you fight for integrity in your profession. How you seek justice and righteousness through your vocation. We don't want to be people who come to church and worship God and then walk out the door and ignore God and the everyday stuff of life. We want to be the kind of people who would be willing to lose our jobs to obey God. The kind of people who would be willing to risk the disapproval of others to obey God. Who would be willing to bear scorn and ridicule to obey God. We want to be the kind of people who see obedience as worship. So I'm just suggesting that for us and for the people in Amos' day, these things can happen subtly and slowly over time. Where we can separate worship and obedience by lots of little small compromises that add up to a lot of distance from God. So what's the solution? How can we bring worship and obedience back together? If we've separated these things, how can we bring these back together? Well, Amos tells us. Look at Amos chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. And, and listen to the exhortation that Amos gives here. Okay? Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you as you have said. Hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. You hear what he's saying? Seek good and not evil. 
Hate evil, love good. Establish justice in the gate. In other words, resolve to obey God. Resolve to do what's right. The prophet Isaiah says something similar in Isaiah 1, 16 and 17. Isaiah says, cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Notice all the action words in that little section of Scripture. Resolve, decide to obey God. Worship God by doing the things that please Him. That's what Isaiah is saying. That's what Amos is saying. Now, some of you, as you hear those verses read, here's what's going on in your mind. You're thinking, oh, that sounds really moralistic. And if you're thinking that, it just shows how far we've separated worship and obedience. Somehow we think if God tells us to do something, that's moralism. No, friends, that's worship. That's worship. Some of us have theologized all the obedience out of Christianity. To where we we hear a moral imperative in Scripture, the only place we go is, well, thank God that Jesus obeyed that for me so I don't have to. Instead of thinking... Thank God that he sent Jesus to die for my disobedience and to empower me for obedience so that I can be set free from my rebellion and disobedience against that and set free to actually pursue a new kind of obedience. I want you to look with me at Amos 5, verse 15. Let's just think about the logic of this verse. Notice what it says. Hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. That's the first half of the verse. It may be that the, the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. That's the second half of the verse. So there's some sort of connection between hate evil, love good, and between God being gracious. And our moralistic hearts tend to read this verse this way. Do A and God will reward you with B. Right? Seek good, hate evil, love good, do that stuff, and then God will be gracious to you. Well, we know that's not what this verse means because of Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Like, this is not a quid pro quo, you obey God, then God will be gracious to you. We know it's not that because the rest of the Bible tells us it's not that. So if that's not the way to read this verse, even though our moralistic hearts sort of instinctively think it is, what, what is the proper way to read this verse? What does this verse mean? Well, it means this. Only when you resolve to obey God will you experience the depth and power of God's grace. Only when you resolve to obey God will you experience the depth and power of God's grace. It seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? Seems like resolute obedience, deciding to be obedient to God, would would just take us back down the path of works righteousness, doesn't it? Well, that's not true at all. See, if you've paid much attention to the teaching of Jesus in the Gospels, here's what you quickly see. Works righteousness is a shallow kind of obedience. This was Jesus' beef with the Pharisees. He said, hey, you guys are... Good, you have a really shallow, superficial obedience, but you've neglected the actual heart issues that are at stake here. The whole Sermon on the Mount is Jesus saying, hey, you've heard it said, but I say to you. Hey, your understanding of the law is shallow and superficial. It hasn't gone deep enough. You don't understand what you're reading. Moralistic, works righteousness kind of obedience has a shallow understanding of God's law. If we really purpose to hate evil and love good and establish justice, do you know what will happen? We'll become aware of how desperately we need empowerment. How desperately we need deep inner change. If you're not earnestly seeking to obey God, your need for Christ and for the grace of the gospel remains very small. But when you set your will to obey Amos 5.15 and verses like it, you begin to realize how desperate you are. Where can you find the power to die to self, to reject evil, to really love what is good, 
to obey God fully and joyfully. For that to become the theme of your life, you need a power for moral integrity and beauty that you do not possess. And that will drive you straight from the book of Amos to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the good news of the gospel, as I've already said, is that Jesus Christ has died and risen from the dead in order to gift his people the power for moral beauty. The power for wholehearted obedience. That power comes from the Holy Spirit. The gift and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the people of God is part of the gospel. It's part of the good news. It's part of the new covenant. It's part of the thing that Jesus came to make possible. Because Jesus has come, there's a new power available for obedience, and that power only belongs to those who trust in Jesus. That power, the presence and influence of the Holy Spirit is available to all who trust in Christ, and only when we seek to resolutely obey God do we really feel our need for the Holy Spirit. And therefore, only when we seek to really obey God do we really experience the depth of the gospel. Because you need a Jesus who didn't just die for you, but who empowers you to change. Look with me at Romans 8, 3, and 4. In these two verses, just a simple summary of what I'm saying. For God has done, that's the, by the way, that's the promise of the gospel. God has done what the law, the commandments of God, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. What these verses are telling you is there's something the law, the commands of God, as beautiful and as good as they are, there's something they can't do. What can't they do? They can't give you any power. They can't give you any power for actual obedience. They can tell you what you should do, but they can't give you any power to do that. So the commands of God are good and beautiful and they are in every way an expression of God's character. They are what we are supposed to do and what we are supposed to be like. And the problem is, if that's all we have, we have no power to be that way. But see, God did what the law couldn't do. What did he do? He sent his son, Jesus Christ, in the flesh as an offering for sin to fulfill the requirement of the law in us by giving us the spirit so that we can walk according to the spirit and not according to the flesh. To say it another way, friends, vital Christianity is Holy Spirit Christianity. Vital Christianity is a daily, moment-by-moment reliance on the person of the Holy Spirit. Which is why vital Christianity is impossible without resolute obedience. You will never know the depth of your need for the Holy Spirit every single moment if you are not committed to obeying God. If you resolve that you are going to obey God to the best of your abilities, you will be conscious frequently of your deep need for the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. How do you get to the depth of the gospel? By resolving to obey. See, church, I want us to experience vital Christianity. I want life to be budding everywhere in our church, the way it's budding everywhere in my yard right now. Right? Just every place I look, there's greenness and vitality and life. That's what I want to be true of our church. And for that to be the case, Amos is telling us, hey, we've got to deal, each of us, with the hypocrisy in our own lives. We've got to ask the question, where have I separated worship and obedience? Where have I given myself permission not to hate evil and seek what's good? Listen again to to the weight of these words in Amos 5.23. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps I will not listen. 
We're about to stand up and sing some songs to God as an expression of our love for him. What a tragedy for us if those songs would be just noise in the ears of God because our hearts are marked by hypocrisy. What a tragedy. How lifeless for us. So let's humble ourselves before God. Let's come in repentance to the Lord Jesus Christ who died for sinners like us. Let's cry out for the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Let's acknowledge our need for a kind of moral integrity and power for obedience that we don't have in and of ourselves, but that is ours by the gracious gift of God. Let's be the kind of people who long for vital Christianity in our own lives first, and then for everyone around us as well. Would you pray with me? God, we want to obey you. And we know the truth that every one of us in this room is a sinner. And so we fail to obey you in the ways we ought. And so we thank the Lord Jesus Christ to die for sin. To die in our place. Thank you that he didn't just die, but rose from the dead and ascended to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit to empower us for a new kind of obedience. So, Father, as we hear these provocative words from Amos about the need for real integrity, the need for real moral beauty in our lives, would you help us not to be weighed down with guilt and shame, but instead help us be moved to turn to Jesus in repentance and faith and to experience a fresh sense of dependence on the Holy Spirit. Thank you that you do not say these things to weigh us down, but rather to pull us into the kind of life you mean for us to live, the kind of life that brings us the most joy and brings you the most glory. So God, wherever in our lives there's hypocrisy and half-heartedness and spiritual deadness, convict us this morning. Bring us to life, awaken repentance and faith and new hope in who you are, and in the beauty of what you promise us in and through the Holy Spirit. We pray this in your name. Amen.